Greetings to all of you and welcome to session six on Paul's letter to the Romans. I'm Timothy Muse, lead pastor here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Alliance, Ohio. And it's a joy to be with you today as we spend time continuing to walk through Paul's letter to the church in Rome. This is a really powerful and important letter, not only for Paul, but also for our understanding as Christians as we live in the world today. So as we continue to dig into this book, we start to see our identity and our faith and our morality and our ethics start to expand. And we have a deeper understanding of what it means to live as Christians. Some 2,000 years after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, we have a whole history of how to live as Christians in the world. This book is one of the foundations of that history. For it was written by Paul about 25 or 30 years after the crucifixion and resurrection. Uh, in a time when believers were waiting for the Christ to return, but he hadn't come back yet. So they had to figure out how to live a Christ-like existence in the world while holding on to their faith in the return and in the eternal life and salvation offered through belief in Jesus Christ. As well, uh, there was the, uh, the reality that Jews and Gentiles were intermingling. Rome was a hotbed. Rome was a, a, a melting pot. Anybody in the world would come to Rome. Ethiopians and Gentiles and uh, people from the East. I mean, Rome had everybody. So how does this Christianity work? And how do people come into contact with Christ who aren't first Jews? Christianity began as very much a Jewish identity. It grew up out of Jerusalem. And its early followers were all Jewish. But God decided to expand the mission. God decided that the mission was larger and greater than just to the Jews. And Paul was the pioneer of being the apostle to the Gentiles. And I've said this before, there was a big argument between Peter and Paul, between the Jerusalem apostles and Paul, about whether someone had to be a Jew before they could be a Christian. Paul didn't believe that to be the case. Paul believed that a Gentile, a barbarian, could convert directly to Christianity. That they didn't have to know the background of of Judaism. They didn't have to know the law and the commandments. In order to convert to Christianity, they could profess Christ as Lord and Savior and then be part of that profession. Now, part of that profession certainly does mean that they would learn it, but they didn't learn it in order, they didn't have to learn it in order to confess it. And that was one of the great sticking points between Paul and the Jerusalem apostles. And we're going to see a little bit about how that starts to play out here. And, and we already saw it where where Paul does talk about God's judgment, God's wrath, and God's grace coming first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. And, and the reason why I came to the Jews first, obviously, as I said last time, is because Jesus is a Jew. Uh, the Jews are God's chosen people. They still are God's chosen people today. Uh, but Jesus was a Jew. He grew up in a Jewish household. So he was first proclaiming to Jews. Not necessarily that that, made, that puts Jews first in line, it just means that they had the first opportunity to experience it. Well, now that they've had the first opportunity to experience it, it's starting to expand amongst the Jewish ranks. Now, through Paul, it is going to start expanding amongst the Gentiles also. And there's going to be some expectations of the Gentiles. One of the, one of the sticking points um, that, that a lot of Jews had who were becoming Christians is that Gentiles really didn't have a law that they had to ascribe to. The Jews have the law. They have the covenant given through Moses, given through uh, the Pentateuch, where the Gentiles don't have that. So can a Gentile just be a, a, a Christian without having any kind of law, without having any kind of moral or ethic or foundational understanding? And Paul's going to address that. Paul's going to address that, and, and that's really where we're going to go today. So we are in the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. Romans is in the New Testament. It is the sixth book in the New Testament, the first of Paul's letters. Uh, I would encourage you to have a Bible in front of you, a printed Bible or a digital Bible, uh, whatever, whatever you have available to you. If you want to call up a digital Bible on the device, you're, if you're watching this on a device, or if you want to pull out a, a printed Bible and use that to follow along. But it's important to read the words. It's important to actually look into the Bible. It's important for us to do that every day, to open our Bible every day to open up uh, the guidebook. You know, if we, um, as believers, ascribe to the fact that the Bible is the divinely inspired Word of God, that the Bible is the basis of God's, of, 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 of God's explaining the work in the world. Um, the Bible is not the basis of God's work in the world. Christ is the basis of God's work in the world. But the Bible is the story of that. 
So if we believe in this God and we believe that the scriptures are divinely inspired, then we should be in the scriptures every day. If only for a moment, if only for a few minutes, if only for a few verses. If this is our guidebook for life, then we should be reading it every day. And if you don't read it every day, and if you want to read it every day, there's plenty of resources out there. Or you can just open up the Bible. 2 Timothy is a great book to start with. The Psalms are a great, book to, a great collection to start with. The Gospel of Matthew or the Gospel of Mark, they're great books to start with. Just reading a little bit every day. I would encourage that. I would implore that. If you're looking to grow in your spirituality, if you're looking to grow closer to God, I would certainly encourage you. The two things I would encourage you to do every day, read the Bible and pray. Read the Bible and pray. Open up your Bible, read a few verses every day and pray. Talk to God. Spend 30 seconds telling God how you're doing. Spend a minute thanking God for all that you have around you. Spend a couple of minutes thanking God and then asking God for support and guidance, prayer, conversation. But also spend time in silence waiting for God to, let, to answer because God does answer. Prayer is not a one-way street. It's a two-way conversation and God does speak. We just need to learn how to listen. And part of that is just opening ourselves to God speaking. All right, so we are in chapter 2, Romans chapter 2. Um, and Paul has been talking about, um, you know, the passing judgment on others. That's where the, the chapter began. Um, and, that, and, and, and that as believers, we don't judge each other. That's not our job. Uh, we are not called to judge each other. We are not called to go outside of the truth. We are called to walk with God. And um, those who choose to walk with God, whether Jew or Greek, doesn't matter. Um, they will they're going to fall. They're going to struggle. So Paul goes forward here. Chapter 2, verse 12 now. All who have sinned apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who have sinned under the law, the law will be judged. All who sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law, for it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous in God's sight, but the doers of the law who are justified. When Gentiles who do not possess the law do instinctively what the law requires, these, though not having the law, are a law to themselves. They show that what the law requires is written on their hearts, to which their own conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts will accuse or perhaps execute them. On the day when, according to my gospel, God, through Jesus Christ, will judge the secret thoughts of all. Okay, so this is one of the main things. Now, you have the Jews and the Gentiles, and, and there's a question that arises. Now, what about these Gentiles who don't have the law? Well, if they perish or if they do wrong, then there's no judgment because there's no law. Well, partly Paul would agree with that, but Paul's going to say, look, anybody who sinned apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. So, so, so the law, and I think this is really a good point for us to, to, to dwell on for a moment, when we talk about the law. When we talk about the law, we usually talk about Luther's first use of the law. And the first use of the law is that we obey the law because we don't want to get in trouble. That's the first use of the law. We obey the law because we don't want to get in trouble. Um, we don't want to get arrested. We don't want to get a ticket. We don't want to get a fine. Okay, so the first use of the law, the law's first use, is to keep people in line through fear. Through fear of punishment. Well, many people function the law that way. Many people see the law as an oppressive force that keeps them from being able to do what they want. That's the first use of the law. And for many, in this particular aspect, they're saying, look, this is first use of the law. What about those who perish outside of the law? What about those who never lived within the law? There's no punishment that comes from the law. They're not punished for their deeds because they don't know the law. And Paul says, look, they're going to be punished. They're going to perish outside the law, um, but they're still going to perish. There's still consequences. There's a different set of laws, a different set of expectations. The human law, the law of nature, the natural law that we all adhere to with each other about treating people right and not taking what isn't ours. So the first use of the law, and this is really first use of the law stuff here, about being jealous. Look, I mean, they don't have to live the law. They don't have the law, so they don't know what's wrong. They can go out and do whatever they want because they're Gentiles where we have to sit here, we have to sit here 
and adhere to this restrictive, oppressive law when we want to go do what they do. Well, if we dwell on the first use of the law, then that's what we get. This jealousy. We get a jealousy that says they, those, others, they get to do whatever they want to do and we don't. They get to sleep in on Sunday morning and we got to come to church. They get to watch certain movies and we choose not to. They get to do the things we want to do and we get to sit here under an angry God who's going to oppress us for not being able to do them. That's the first use of the law. The second use of the law, which those who adhere to the law, it would be, it, it's the desire that they move into the second and even to the third use of the law, which I'll get to in a minute. The second use of the law, the second reason why we follow the law is not because we're going to get in trouble, but because we know it's for good order. We follow the law because it actually is better for other people when we follow the law. Let's use a red light example, and I've used this before, the red light here at the corner of Union and Beach. Okay, if I run that red light, I could get a ticket. First use of the law, I don't run the red light because I don't want to get a ticket. Second use of the law, I don't want to run the red light because if I run the red light, I put myself and someone else at risk. It's not good order. It's not good civil society if everybody breaks the law. Because we all depend on each other following the law in order to be able to move about society well. Could you imagine what that intersection would look like if, every, if it was just all green lights? Anybody just keep going through? Nobody yielding right of way? The society wouldn't benefit. When we are able to move into the second use of the law and see that following the law is good for us and for each other, then following the law becomes pleasant because we know it protects us and it protects each other. The third use of the law, and this is the most difficult use of the law, the third use of the law is we follow the law because it makes God happy. Because God is pleased with us when we follow the law. So actually following the law is a blessing, it's a gift. Because in doing so, we please God. But most people just reside in the first use of the law. Most people just reside in that, I don't want to get in trouble. I don't care about anybody else. I just don't want to get in trouble, so I'm going to follow the law. And that's what, that, that's what Paul's responding to here. Paul's responding to this, this jealousy, if you will, between the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews are like, look, we got to follow this law, and it's oppressive, and God is, is, is telling us we can't do these things. And those Gentiles over there, they don't have to do it. They don't have to do it. And we're jealous. Paul says, all who have sinned apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. So if they don't know the law and they're breaking the law, well, then they don't have the boundary of love and grace and hope that the law brings. And they'll die outside of that love and grace and hope, that boundary. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. So this is Paul's caveat to say, look, if those Gentiles over there are doing something and, and it's breaking the law, if you think that you can do what they're doing because they're doing it, you will be judged under the law. There's a far cry difference between acting out of ignorance and acting out of rebellion. If the Gentiles are acting out of ignorance because they don't know the law, that's one thing. But if a Jew knows the law and acts outside of it, they're going to be judged based on the law, not out of, look, they got to do it, I should get to do it too. This is a hard concept because we like fairness and we like to act in fairness. We function in fairness. Why do they get to do something that I don't get to do? Because they didn't know they shouldn't do it, but you do know you shouldn't do it. That's what Paul's saying. You Jews who live under the law, if you see a Gentile breaking the law, and you decide to throw the law into the wind and do what they're doing, knowing it's wrong, you're going to be judged by it. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous in God's sight, but the doers of the law who will be justified. So knowing the law, hearing the law, it's not just good enough. It's not good enough to just hear it and know it. It's, it you need to use it. James would talk about this, faith without works is dead. Um, and not that, not that works get us into heaven, but, but if you have faith, but you're not living that faith out, well, you don't, really don't have faith. You just have this knowledge, this matrix of, of belief. But if that faith isn't leading you to do something, then it's not faith. If it's not changing your life, then it's not faith. Same with the law. If, if there are those who hear the law, but don't do anything with it, 
if the law says don't steal, okay, I know I'm not supposed to steal, but I'm going to go out and steal anyway, well, then I'm going to be judged. Not, for, not because the Gentiles stole, but I'm going to be judged because I knew I wasn't supposed to and I did it anyway. And we know, you know, and, and, and that's really the thing. That's what makes that's that's what makes this whole Jesus life simple but not easy. Jesus makes it pretty clear for us how we're supposed to live. And when we choose not to do that, we make the choice. It's a covenantal choice. And we decide to act in a certain way that the reprisal from the Savior isn't as important as the action. We've talked about this before. When Gentiles who do not possess the law do instinctively what the law requires, these, though not having the law, are a law to themselves. So, Paul's look, basically saying, look this, this is the deal. There are those who know the law and don't follow. There are those who know the law and follow. And there are those who don't know the law, but still act in a manner that represents the law, the spirit of the law that God has given. You shall not murder. Okay? Now that's a law given to us by God. But that's a law that precedes the law of God. I mean, God, that, that, that's just kind of human nature. We shouldn't be taking the life of another. If we can't give it, we shouldn't be taking it. So if you have a Gentile who has no idea that God said to Moses on Mount Sinai, you shall not murder, but is living a life and not murdering anybody else, well, then they are following that law. And that has merits. They are living a law that shows what it means to have a relationship with God, even if they're not bound by the covenantal law given. They show that what the law requires is written on their hearts, to which their own conscience also bears witness. And their conflicting thoughts will accuse or perhaps execute. Or perhaps, excuse me, perhaps excuse them on the day when according to my gospel, God through Jesus Christ will judge the secret thoughts of all. So, so, so Paul is basically laying out here that you can have people in the covenant not doing what they're supposed to be doing, and you can have people outside the covenant doing what they're supposed to be doing. Just because you know, it's not enough. It's not enough just to know the law. It's not enough to know what's right. It's enough to do it. And it's better to do what's right even if you don't know it. And that's where the Gentiles are. You know, we want to kind of paint them as barbarians and heathens and, and, and less thans. But they're not. Paul says they're not. The Gentiles are not. They know instinctively what the Jews had to be told through a tablet, through the Ten Commandments. They know instinctively what God wants them to do. And that has merit. Because God judges, and, and here's, here's the big thing, God judges the secret thoughts of all. So it's not just actions, my brothers and sisters. It's not just what we do, but it's also what we think. It's about what resides in our heart. Paul, uh, Jesus talks about this in the Gospel of Matthew when he says, you know, the law, the, the law says do not murder, but I tell you, if you look at someone else in anger, you're murdering them. God just doesn't judge our actions. God judges our thoughts. So if you're sitting there stewing and angry at someone, and you're not saying anything, but you're casting thoughts out towards them, God's paying attention to that. That's why forgiveness and reconciliation is so important. That's why we do it every Sunday in church. All right, so chapter uh, we're still in chapter 2, verse 17 here now. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast of your relationship to God... And know his will and determine what is best because you are instructed by the law. And if you are sure that you are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the fools, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then that teach others, will you not teach yourselves? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You that forbid adultery, do you commit adultery? You that abhor idols, do you rob temples? You that boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. 
so Paul now is talking directly to the Jews again. He's talking about hypocrisy. He's talking about those who don't know the law, living outside the law, not worthy of the law. But what he's, all, but what he's directing at is he's directing at those who know the law, but don't follow it. About those who know what is right, but don't do it. Again, ignorance versus rebellion. Ignorance versus willfulness. This is something that Jesus really struggled with and Jesus really put up against. He called a lot of people hypocrites. A hypocrite is a, an actor. Someone who knows what's right but doesn't do it. Someone who follows, someone who proclaims, preaches what they should do but not do it at the same time. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a preacher. And I work very hard to not stand up and proclaim something that I'm actually doing myself. <laughs> I'm not one who believes to do as I say, not as I do. That's modeling. And I try to model the behavior the best as possible. I don't always succeed at it, but I try to model the behavior as best as possible. And that's what Paul is saying that the Jews aren't doing. They're not modeling. They're throwing stones at the Gentiles for not knowing the law, proclaiming themselves as elite because they know the law, but they're not living what the law teaches. They're a mockery, not only of the command and the law, but of themselves a byword, a blasphemy. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Blasphemy is to speak irreverently. God has spoken irreverently because here's God's people acting outside of the accordance of the law while at the same time condemning others for being better but not having the law. God is less than because the people of God can't be bothered to follow the law. You know, as I read that, as I hear that, as I think about where a lot of churches are right now, a lot of faith communities are right now, that really rings true. That really rings true. People who proclaim with their lips, but their actions are far from me, as God would say in Isaiah. People who proclaim with their lips, but their, their hearts are far from me. I see it all too often. People who, pro who proclaim Christ but don't act it. And that's a dangerous place to be. Because the proclamation only is going to go so far. And if you're acting one way and proclaiming another, then what's the lie? We can say anything we want. Our actions are what speak to who we are. So we can say whatever we want, but our actions are, are, are what speak to who we are. So that's where Paul is. That's what Paul's calling out here. He's calling the people out, saying, if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast of your revelation to God and know his will and determine what is best because you are instructed, uh, instructed in the law, and if you are sure that you're doing all these things, you're forbidding all this stuff, you're talking about all this stuff, but at the same time you're doing it, then you're literally blaspheming the name of God. You're saying, God, your law is important to someone else, but not to me. I'm better than that. I'm better than you. You say don't commit adultery, and people shouldn't commit adultery, but I'm better than you, so I can go and commit adultery, and I'm not held by that same law. That's the danger that Paul is addressing. Because the Jews are basing their relationship with God on having the law whether they follow it or not doesn't matter. Just that they have it. They're looking down on the Gentiles, claiming the Gentiles to be less than because they don't have the law, even if they are acting in a better stance than the Jews are. All right, so um, verse 25. Circumcision indeed is a value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcised. Uncircumcision. So if those who are uncircumcised keep the requirements of the law, will not their uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then those who are physically uncircumcised but keep the law will condemn you that have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is true circumcision something external or physical. Rather, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly. And a real circumcision is a matter of the heart. It is a spiritual and not literal 
Such a person receives praise not from others, but from God. All right, so Paul's bringing up the physical mark of Judaism and that circumcision. We go back to Abraham. Abraham, God prescribed that Abraham practice circumcision. And that every male is marked with circumcision to know that they're part of the covenant. I... You know, I, I, I guess there was probably a ritual to prove that. Not really quite sure how that would go along. Um, I'm glad that we have the mark of the Holy Spirit on our forehead, and that's not something that we have to prove in the church. Uh, just saying. Um, but for the Jews, circumcision was something very important. Because it was a mark of the covenant. It was a mark of meaning. However, Paul says, look, it only has value if you're following the law. The mark only has value if you're following the law as God has prescribed it. The mark has no value if you're not going to follow the law. If you're not going to do the work of being a faithful person, then whether you're marked or not doesn't matter. You know, I've, I've, I've had many over the, the, the course of my ministries. People would come up to me and they would find out who I am and what I do and where I serve. And they would say, oh, I'm a member of that church. Okay, well, I, I've, I've been there for, for a number of years and I've never met you. Well, that membership doesn't mean anything or it means very little because it's not being used. The same with circumcision. Circumcision was the mark of a Jew. But the circumcision has no value if you're not going to do what it means to be a Jew. If you're not going to live under the law, then circumcision, I mean, you can't walk up to the gates and go, God, you know, I mean, I was a gut rot sinner. I didn't care about your law, but I'm circumcised, so let me in. God says, no, no. That's not how it works. Circumcision, the mark of belonging, only has meaning if you're going to live into it. If you're not going to live into it, then the circumcision has no meaning, it has no value. It's just like a marriage or a relationship. If you're not going to live into it, then it has no meaning or value. And those who are uncircumcised, outside of the covenant, if they keep the law, if they keep the requirements, then their uncircumcision will be regarded as circumcision. They're living the life. So whether they have the mark or not, they have the mark. Because in the Christian realm, the circumcision isn't physical, it's spiritual. It's the circumcision of the heart. It's a mark left inside of us to show that this Savior has meaning to us. So, those who are physically uncircumcised but keep the law and have the written code and circumcision, and, and those who are physically uncircumcised but keep the law will condemn you that have the written code and circumcision but break the law. So an uncircumcised who follows the way of God can condemn a circumcised who doesn't. And it's not that it's not that they can stand over someone and say, you're going to burn in hell. But their actions, and then the, the actions of the circumcised are what condemn them. Because they're not showing that God has any meaning or purpose or power in their lives. You see, though, so this all comes down to Living the right way, following the law, the mark isn't enough. It's not enough just to be a Jew. It's not enough just to have a lineage. It's not enough just to belong. You've got to more than belong. You've got to be active. You've got to participate. You've got to show that that belonging has meaning. If it doesn't have meaning, then what's the point of belonging? Who cares? If it doesn't have meaning, then you're not going to do what it's expected to do. So for Paul, it doesn't matter whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised. This was another argument that was coming from uh, the Jerusalem apostles. Was that every Christian should be circumcised. And Paul says no. Circumcision is part of the, the Abrahamic covenant. And God never laid down that the Gentile Christians should be circumcised. That was never part of the deal. 
Circumcision is part of the Abrahamic covenant, not part of the Christian covenant. It's still practiced, of course. Um, but circumcision is not part of the Christian covenant. It is not meant to be. It is not meant to be a Christian thing. It's a Hebrew thing. It's a Jewish thing. So to require Gentile Christians to be circumcised, is, it, it, it's unacceptable. Because you can be uncircumcised and follow the way of God, and you can be circumcised and not follow the way of God. It's possible. It's actually doable. That's what, exactly what Paul is talking about here. Too many are relying on the physical mark of their faith and not living out, hey, it doesn't matter, I can do whatever I want, I'm circumcised. And there's many in the Christian realm, hey, it doesn't matter, I can do whatever I want, I'm a Christian. God loves me, God's going to forgive me, I can do whatever I want. It doesn't work that way. God doesn't draw us in and love us and give us the gift of the Holy Spirit only for us to go out and do whatever we want to do and make a mockery of it. It means so much more. It means so much more. A person who is a Jew who is one inwardly, rather a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and real circumcision is a matter of the heart. It is a spiritual and not physical. Such a person receives praise not from others, but from God. So, so again, Paul is saying, look, this, this expression of faith is an inward thing, not an outward thing. You can't walk around and go, hey, I'm circumcised, I'm a Jew, I'm important, while, while at the same time breaking the law of God. Because at the end of the day, it's not about whether everybody else knows you're a Jew, whether everybody else knows you're faithful. It's about what God knows. It's about coming before God in faithfulness. And if that causes people to, to push away or be ashamed or be angry, then that's on them, not on you. True circumcision isn't something we show off to the world. It's something that we show off to God. God is the one who sees that faithfulness, not the world. So Paul is really combating hypocrisy here. Um, he's combating the idea that the Jews are trying to oppress the Gentiles by saying that they're better. Paul's saying, no, that's not the case. It's not about being better or worse. It's about being faithful. It's about following the law and following what's expected. All right, my friends, we're going to break here for today. Uh, we're going to break here. We'll come back next week with session seven. Uh, my contact information will come up at the end of the session. If you have any questions or thoughts, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll do the best I can to answer them. If I don't get to them in the next session, I'll try to answer them directly. God bless you. Have a great day with whatever it brings, and we'll see you again next time.